Welcome to another edition of Punch TV. It's spring-ish, and there is so much happening in April in Saskatoon for, for nerd dumb. So we want to put a few things on your radar. Uh, right off the bat, we are going to talk with uh, Richard Carnegie. He is the director of the uh, Youth Orchestra, and they're paired up with the symphony, and they're putting on a Star Wars show, and that's on April 22nd. And uh, if you're watching this early on in the month and you want to win some tickets, all you got to do is uh, comment on our Facebook or Twitter feed, and uh, yeah, you could be there for free. It's also Tabletop Month, so board games, extraordinaire, so many good board games. I have brought in some from my personal collection that I'm going to sit down with Tony the Collector and talk about a little bit. Uh, of course, we've got Tweet Beat and we've got Craig the Movie Geek, so there's tons in store this month, and uh, we hope you enjoy the show. So. Let's get busy. Oh, it's, in, it's Easter. I forgot. One of our guests. Oh, my God. We have Kathleen Poole, and she has some crazy cool eggs. So, yeah, it's so full. So it's a basket full of Easter eggs of, good, of nerdy goodness this month. So uh, stay tuned. Well, we're really excited about a big event that is hitting Saskatoon April 22nd. Mashup City. We've got the symphony, a little highbrow entertainment mixing in with the uh, Star Wars. And we have special guest today, Richard Carnegie from the symphony. Um, and he is directing this extravaganza. So tell me a little bit about the show. Uh, the, the, the show is uh, a tribute to, to Star Wars and the music of, of John Williams. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only is the symphony going to be playing, but also the Saskatoon Youth Orchestra, which I direct, uh, they'll be performing as well. So it's actually going to be uh, the SSO music director, Eric Paco, that's doing all the, the directing. But it's going to be really exciting because we'll have the 70 musicians uh, from the youth orchestra on stage with the you know, 60 or 70 musicians from the symphony. This guy might be there as well. It's oh, going to yeah. be fantastic. Um, I, we're really excited because we're going to be a part of it. We're going to come and maybe do some costume judging. Mm -hmm. So all you folks out there, make sure you wear your finest Jedi or Sith attire so that uh, you can win some really, really cool prizes and, you know, just get into the spirit of the thing. It's pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, how awesome is it for the youth orchestra to get to play side by side with the rock stars? Oh, the, it's, it's, it's an symphony. absolute thrill. Uh, the players look forward to it. it we, we're very fortunate that every year we're able to do uh, a, a piece of music side by side with the symphony and then to get to do something so substantial. We're doing an entire suite of music uh, from Star Wars The Force Awakens. Uh, and so it's not only, it's the kind of music that you, you, you just cannot help but get excited and thrilled for. And then to get to do that side by side, often with their teachers who play in the symphony, it's, it's, it's something that everyone looks forward to. Well, the music is such an integral part of those movies. Like mm -hmm. they move the plot along and, you know, characters have their own theme. And so like it builds this whole world around them. So yeah. like it's, and also if you've ever been to a Star Wars Z kind of concert before, mm -hmm. you won't have heard the new stuff, right? Yeah. So it's important people check this out. The, new, the music for from uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens has certain little motifs and, and little bits from the old movies, but it's an entirely new score, and it's so thrilling. I, I don't know if you've seen this. There's this thing on YouTube. It's a uh, Star Wars without the music, and it's the last scene from A New Hope, but they just take all the music out there, and the only thing that you can basically hear is Chewbacca going, Rawr! that's the worst <laughs> Chewbacca impression ever. But it, it, all of the, the majesty, all of the drama is just completely taken away from it because Star Wars wouldn't be Star Wars without the music. No. No, you have to have it, and it's amazing. So I'm um, really, really looking forward to, to that a lot. Now, you wear a lot of hats with the symphony. You not only direct the youth orchestra, but you actually play in the orchestra as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how long have you been a part of that? I've been with the symphony for 10 years, and I've been directing the youth orchestra, I should know this, I think for the last <laughs> six or seven years. Um, how do you how do you find that you get like a lot of um, like folks who are in the youth orchestra transitioning into the the main one? We've had a number of, of people. In, in fact, there's a crossover. There's some uh, players who play in the symphony. They've successfully auditioned for the symphony, and they also play in the youth orchestra because they happen to be young and they still enjoy playing in the in the youth orchestra. So wow, that yeah. injection of that youth into you know the spectrum is pretty exciting mm, to mm -hmm. have like members from like all walks of life. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that's so exciting about symphonic music is that it, it brings together so many people from so many different uh, age groups. You know, when we think about the, the, the symphony, the, there's such a, a wide variety in there, but we're all coming together to, for 
common goal to make great music together. That's right. The sum of the parts, you know, mm -hmm. the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? Indeed. Um, so if someone was interested in getting involved with the youth orchestra, how would they go about doing that? They should go to our website, syo.ca. Um, any young players of orchestral instruments. Once a year, we have an open house. Uh, it's too late for, for this year, but any week can be open house. If, they, if they're interested in coming and checking out a rehearsal, like drop us an email. We'd be happy to, to have them come talk with one of our, uh, our existing players, um, tell them a little bit about it and yeah. Ah, that's a very exciting opportunity mm -hmm. on the table, so take advantage of that. Well, I want to say thank you for coming out today, and uh, we have some passes to give away for this extravaganza, so if you want to win, just comment on our Twitter feed or on our Facebook page, and uh, don't forget to start planning those costumes, because you're going to want to come out in style and look great and maybe win another prize, uh, courtesy of Punch TV, so... Uh, April 22nd? Yep, and those are the comments you're looking for. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Exactly. For sure. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Really appreciate it. Thanks so it. much, Jody. We'll be right back after this. Punch TV is brought to you in part by Amazing Stories, providing Saskatoon with comics, games, toys, graphic novels, t-shirts, and more for over 22 years. Online at AmazingStoriesComics.com, in person on 8th Street in Saskatoon. Hello lovely ladies and or dudes. My name is Hank and with me right now is as always my BFF in the whole wide world. It's Tony and today on Tweet Beat. Oh hey Tony. Everything that you need to be watching, reading or listening to is going to appear somewhere on your screen because last night I had a dream. It was an upsetting dream and of course when I dream, I dream about Tony and in this dream, poor Tony, he's not the Tony that we all love. It looks like this. It was a Tony that was never exposed to Star Wars. There was no Star Wars. And in my dream, Tony collected My Little Pony, and everybody called him Tony the Brony, and it was horrible. So we're kind of forgoing the tweet beat today because I have to ask a couple very important questions. Tony, yes. if Star Wars never existed, if George Lucas was never born, what do you think you would be up to right now? Um, you know, uh, you asked me that earlier, and uh, it's so it's not a surprise. And in 1978, they had a Dallas was huge, and they started come or they came up with some prototypes of the Dallas action figures. But because of the the whole space thing at that time, people just weren't interested in Dallas figures. So I think because my love of Dallas in 1978, the whole Suan, the you know Jr. I think that would have probably stemmed you know into something bigger with Dallas. Could you fill storage lockers full of Dallas merchandise, do you no, think? No, because it up to... uh, I'd probably would move on to other TV things and Mork and Mindy and that kind of stuff. So I probably would have had, like, a, it wouldn't all be Star Wars, it would have been more of that kind of thing. So. And if Star Wars had never existed, uh, where do you think you would be working today? Like, what now, what do you um, think you would be up to? I definitely wouldn't be working at a comic store, I guarantee that. Well, and obviously you'd be yeah. single. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> no, I probably would not be single, because I also really? wanted to be a bit of a gigolo. Really? Uh, yeah, so I was hoping that I could, you know, kind of branch out into gigoloism. I don't really know what that word is, so, but that's what I was told. Yeah, it's an ism. No, but I don't even know what a gigolo is, really, so. Richard Gere, I think, was a gigolo, and I think he's pretty cool. So yeah. he was all right. Yeah. Even now, he's kind of like a silver fox. He is okay? a silver fox. I would like to be. I would be a silver fox. I think <laughs> you right would. Now. I would be. You would. And I would have all we my hair. It. I think if there was no Star <laughs> Wars, no Star I would Wars. have all, have my all your hair. hair. I would have all my well, hair. Hopefully, I'd have all my hair too. Tons of ladies. Yes, that's what would happen. Nice. It would have changed the universe to hair and, and ladies. And speaking of time, we're pretty much out of it, so we're going to rainbow dash out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no? If you're watching a super late at night, that joke killed, right? It did. I'm Hank, this is Tony. Uh, check us out at Hank and Kelso and at Shaw Punch TV. See you next time on Tweepy. Wait, 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 aren't we talking about movies and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> that was it? It was just about me being an idiot? Yeah. Welcome to The Collector. <laughs> Holy moly. I am here today with my guest, Jody Kaysen. She's uh, new to the show. Yep. Uh, we just thought we would bring her in and chat about your game collection. 
I don't know, a lot of people like collect games from the 70s and 80s mostly, I imagine. Um, yeah, I had to go cold turkey because I have actually too many collections. Like, How many I games, how many games are you talking I about I don't right even now? know, I don't even know. Like, like, a lot of them are in the attic now. Okay, you know in the Royal Tannenbaums when they go into that closet and it's yes. just full of games? Like, yes. I have that. <laughs> so there, there's a lot of really goofy games and most of them are not very good, but I kind of just had to go cold turkey after maybe about like 98. <laughs> Awesome. and try not to collect more games. That was really just cool. That was yeah. awesome. And the games that you collected are obviously games that are older games that are no longer in production, and yeah. it's amazing, yeah. Um, I really wanted to focus on, like, just the goofy stuff like when I had that I had when I was a kid, and then, like, TV shows and pop culture type stuff, so that's kind of the parameters of it. All right, let's talk about this game. Vanilla Ice rap, electronic rap game. Now, yes. I, this is a, a game that you have sealed. I know most of the other ones are not sealed. So yeah. you bought this one? I did. Yeah, where did you find such a gem? Um, I think I actually got this one either at the Bay or Toys R Us. So this is a game you bought right oh, during oh, the yeah. Okay, so um, I did new. get a discount because it was like on the shelf for a long time because <laughs> I think every copy of the Vanilla Ice game was on the shelf for a long time, but I did was like, yeah, I got to pick that up because like you get the beatbox with it. <laughs> and so it's a really terrible game though. Basically you have cards and you just try to like fill in the blanks and then when you have a line, you wrap that along with the beatbox and then you get the line and it sucks. Okay, it's sealed. <laughs> it we is talked sealed. about it earlier. We did. And this is, this is a game that you want to open but I'm not letting you open it. Cause... Okay, this is true. Okay, I looked it up on eBay. It's going for like $200 <laughs> sealed. And it's like, what? So yeah, I, I was all gang ready to go to like pop it open today and like do some rapping. But uh, yeah, I will. Uh, I'll go along with you and say, okay, we'll leave it in the package. Okay. So this came up earlier when we were yeah. we were demoing games. So what is this this Snifty Snakes game? Okay. So this is fit your Snifty Snake and Snout and push your crazy cones about. Fab new skill game full of fun, laughs and jokes for everyone. <laughs> so you have to like use your nozzle here to like push your guy. <laughs> and make a big mess. Um, yeah, push your guy like into the hole before everybody else. And it kind of takes on like a hungry, hungry hippos feel when everybody else is playing because they got their things on and you're like in there and you're trying to do your thing and yeah, it's just goofy. So yeah, that and and now with like these other crazy games, they should bring this back because this is this is pretty awesome. Uh, Speak like, Out is a really big yeah. game right now that's kind of playing on the yeah, face the most, thing. Yeah. Yeah, this one this you don't better. get all like. This seems way more yes. hygienic. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because so. it's only your nose <laughs> yeah. that's actually getting all snotty yeah. with the thing. So, all right, yeah. okay. So here we go. Now you got some kind of uh, racy games. Came I do. Yes, yeah, some racy games. Like, racist? I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't know, but it's like. Yeah. Okay, I love this game. It's actually a very good game, um, and this is the you don't have to be Chinese to play the Shop Suey game, um, or the French version, which is il n'est pas ne Nécessaire d'être chinois pour jouer le jeu chop suey game. Okay, so it's kind of like perfection. You like wind up the bowl that has all these different pieces in it. Okay. And then there's a menu that has all the pieces and they have different point values because some of them are like round and hard to pick up with your chopsticks. So again, Hungry Hungry Hippo style where everybody is just kind of going mad dog and, and trying pick to up. pick up pieces and put them in the bowl before. Oh. And like other people will be like, no, I want that, you know? Well, that does seem you. like fun. I didn't really quite understand the game, but now that I get it, it seems yeah. like Yeah, and when the like, timer runs out, yes. you like How count many? up like what your point value is from the menu. And then you win based on that. Okay, so now. But I, I also like the box. I gotta talk about the box. Okay, Cause it's like the most oh. random, weirdest <laughs> family picture on a box ever. A cop in like a wife beater and suspenders. And then you got like some grandma here with like curlers and stuff. And then two kids that like are not theirs. This like, is the most stereotypical uh, box of that time that you like, everyone's like, hey, look, there's the grandma with the curlers. Cause like, that's how you would see grandma. Right. Grandma's with curlers. But also that's... like, it, like you would think they might play to some kind of Asian theme on it yes, and no, not, no. they're all white. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Whatever. Anyways, I love this game. 
it's a good game, even if it's a little sketchy. Okay, so Charlie's Angels, yeah. All in the Family, are these games like worth playing or are they just... Um, most games that are based on TV shows are terrible. Yeah. Like they're just not good. Um, but you get to like be Jill or Kelly or Sabrina or whatever. So like it's really good. The only one that I would highly recommend based on TV show is the All My Children game. It's like Risk and Clue together. It's awesome. If you can get your hands on a copy of this, it's very good. Um, do you need to know who the All My Children Not really. Are it helps if you know who the characters are. But yeah. it do you know who the characters from oh, yeah. that time? Who is like who? I don't even know who these people Erica are. Erica Kane, baby. No, I don't know who that Su is. Susan yeah. Lucci, she got nominated like 20 times for an Emmy before she finally won. <laughs> for All, all yeah. My Children. And they family. did like 10,000 episodes. <laughs> that is awesome. Favorite game here? You think it is probably the. I would have to say Chop, Chop Suey game. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. I love it. Cool. Thanks, Jody, for coming back. Thanks. Well, it's tabletop month. Because yes. tabletop oh, yes, day is exactly. at the end of this month. Yes. It's on the 29th, and there's all kinds of stuff happening in the city. So, yeah, so. Um, play a board game this month. It's a cool yeah. thing. And you should go out and go to your garage sales and find old games. Because you do find games like this, and no one seems to want them, but these are actually fun games. Yeah. Cool. There you go. Uh, we'll be right back after this message. Punch TV is brought to you in part by Amazing Stories, providing Saskatoon with comics, games, toys, graphic novels, t-shirts, and more for over 22 years. Online at AmazingStoriesComics.com, in person on 8th Street in Saskatoon. All right, well, welcome back. I am here with special guest Kathleen Poole and her beautiful artistry. These eggs are stupendously awesome. How long have you been doing this for? I've been doing this for maybe about four years kind of seriously. Like I did a few when I was younger with my grandma, but just recently I started getting really into doing it. So this is a family tradition then, basically? Yeah. Okay, so was your grandma like really hardcore and um, an amazing artist as well? She was. She made them for years and years and years. She would make so many. She'd sell them to people. She was really good. Cool. Well, they're amazing. And I love how you've taken, like, I mean, obviously the traditional style um, is breathtaking, but I personally love how you've transitioned that into something like super nerdy and great. So um, how did that come about? My family actually pushed me to do it. I was happy just doing like the traditional ones, but then my sisters and my dad were like, well, try making some other ones, like design your own, make me some cool ones. And so I started doing those because they kind of pushed me too. And I thought it was really neat once I started it. Okay, awesome. Way to go, pool family for, <laughs> for that. We appreciate that. Um, okay, is, is this like the band? Yes. Yeah, that's the band. I made that one for my dad. He asked it for for. He asked for it for Christmas one year, so. That's awesome, shout out to Prog Rock, <laughs> so good stuff there. Okay, so how long does it take you to actually like make one of these eggs? It depends on how complex it is. Something like this one here, it has a lot of line work, a lot of big blocked out areas, and so that one might take maybe two and a half to three hours. Something that's more simple like this or this, it might only take like, one and a half, two hours. I'm, I'm amazed that it's that quick because there's like a million little dots and lines and everything. Like I would expect that it would be, you know, days and then you'd have to wait between layers and stuff. So um, what is the, the kind of process, I guess? Do you use waxes and things or how do you like get such intricate detail? Yeah, so I have a stylus and it kind of has like a handle and a little metal part that you put wax into and you use that to draw on the egg. So you would draw on to block out whatever color you want to be the current color that's dyed in. So for example, you would start out with the white. You would draw everything you want to be white on the egg with the wax. Then you would put it into the next darkest color, which is usually yellow. And then once you have it dyed yellow, you go and draw all the yellow parts and you keep on going on until you get to the darkest color, which is usually black. So like with an egg like this, like by the time you got to black, like it's pretty covered with wax then do yeah. you have to do any recovering or like once you cover it it's like good to go no once you have it on a color that's going to stay on for the entire process and then taking the wax off is that problematic 
No, I just use my grandma's method, which is to put it in a toaster oven and that just melts the wax right off of it. You just wipe the rest off with a paper towel, so. Grand's got the hot <laughs> tips, okay, because yeah. like I've made them not like this. Mine were really crummy, but um, like where you like take a candle and you're just kind of like oh, yeah, melt and like wipe, very... melt, wipe, melt, and it seems to take forever. So that's I guess a that's why it's very traditional method. Yeah, okay, so um, the blowing out of the yolk, because these are hollow. Um, when I did it, again, like, ah, it's the worst. Like, doing it is really fun and they look so great, but like, you poke the hole and then you're like blowing and then like, it's all gummed up and you're like fighting with it and it's super delicate so you don't want to smash it. Like, you don't do that with all of these, do you? No, nowadays they have some better technology okay. and I have actually a little kind of hand pump. It has a pump that you just use with your hands and it has a needle that sticks into the air and you just force the air into the egg, into the hole and it forces the yolk out of the same hole. Okay, so um, do you do you eat the egg <laughs> that you force out or is it just kind of no. like, that's collateral loss? <laughs> yeah, so. the dyes can penetrate the shell and you can't really eat the dyes. So, so. You, you blow them up after you've decorated <laughs> yeah. them? Yeah, yeah. if you blow them before, then you could eat it, but then it kind of floats around in the dye and you yeah. have to like block out the hole with wax and it's just a hassle. <laughs> okay, that is a tip that I did not know. So <laughs> next time I make some uh, Easter eggs, uh, hopefully they will look somewhat like yours and <laughs> not that's impossible but you know to, to get close would be a real reward for me so um this is awesome it's like easter this month so um hopefully we'll give people out there some inspiration on what they can do other than just kind of like dipping it into some purple dye and throwing a sticker on it uh these are amazing so uh if anybody wants to have a special commission i know you you have done that in the past and uh you guys can contact us at punch tv on our facebook page or through twitter and we will get you in touch with kathleen so thank you so much for bringing these i really really love them they're they're awesome and way to go Good thank job. you so much all right uh we'll be uh, right back with the movie geek All right, I'm here with the Movie Geek, and um, today we're kind of taking things on a bit of a somber note for our theme. Well, it's going to be a celebration of life, let's call okay. it. Okay. So uh, this is obviously now a, a little bit later, but uh, Bill Paxton uh, died February 25th, 2017, at the pretty young age of 61. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I was pretty shocked and saddened by this, and obviously we've seen a lot of celebrity deaths in the last while, and somebody like Carrie Fisher hits us really big. Yeah. But I was thinking about Bill Paxton and the idea that most people think of him as this sort of daddish actor, you know, he was right. obviously the dad in Big Love. Uh, but years before, when I was a kid and growing up, when, when we were all kids, uh, he was in a lot of kind of nerdier movies, really. Chat! Yeah, exactly. So, like, uh, so I thought I'd compile a list of some of the, like, must-see Bill Paxton uh, movies that are sort of on that nerdier edge. Now, obviously, uh, you'll notice I left out Titanic and Twister because I hate those movies. They're bad. Uh, I will quickly mention Terminator, obviously, one of his early yes. small roles. Uh, but it's, it just wasn't quite big enough to make this list. Uh, Tombstone, same thing. I actually forgot he was in that, but he plays Morgan right. Earp. Uh, and Edge of Tomorrow from 2014, a really underrated oh, yeah. uh, Tom Cruise uh, sci-fi movie. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Frailty which he directed, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and One False Move he was also in. And, uh, of course, I mentioned Big Love. And we also should mention Fish Heads. Roly fish poly. heads, fish heads, roly poly fish heads. So uh, go go YouTube this thing, look it yeah. up. But it's it's quite insane, and he directed it like when he was really young as a music video for uh, some band. So, but it got played on Saturday Night Live, and I think when we were growing up, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like played ad nauseum on Much Music. Oh, and MTV, because it was just one of those little things that was filler. Like a bumper for... in between the yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, uh, it's this crazy little video that's really fun. So, but uh, here's my top five Bill Paxton sort of nerdier movies. Some <laughs> Uh, so, Weird Science, you mentioned Chet, 1985, John Hughes, this is actually my favorite John Hughes movie, more so than Sixteen Candles or any of yeah. those things, it's just infinitely quotable, and of course he plays the uh, sort of Elan Michael Smith's older brother that's a real jerk. Yeah, and, uh, he's like the, the, the iconic jerk brother who just like never lets you get away with anything and just like pushes all your buttons all the time. Yeah, and so there's so many, like this movie is infinitely quotable. He's got some great lines. Many of them we couldn't even say no. uh, on TV here, but 
How about a nice greasy pork sandwich served in a dirty <laughs> ashtray? That one reminds me of him. So uh, definitely a great, funny, quotable movie. Yeah. Uh, of course, the next one is 1986's Aliens, yes. where he plays uh, Colonial Marine Private Hudson. He's funny. He's annoying. Almost he seems like he's kind of a coward, but he's obviously not because yeah. he's a Colonial Marine. And of course, in the end, he's very heroic. Again, lots of quotable lines. There's, game over, man, game over. <laughs> but of course, my favorite line is uh, when Ripley says, Hudson, this little girl survived longer than that with no weapons and no training. And he pauses for a second. He goes, why don't you just put her in charge, man? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I love that movie, and I love his uh, performance in it. Uh, one that's a little bit more obscure, 1987's Near Dark. Now, of course, this features uh, Bill Paxton and Lance Henriksen and Jeanette Goldstein from Aliens yeah. and was directed by Catherine Bigelow, who went on to marry uh, James Cameron, who directed Aliens. Uh, and it's about a sort of small-town farmer's son that kind of joins a pack of vampires uh, and, and the ins and outs of that, and he plays the kind of psychotic member of the vampire tribe. Yeah, and it's an awesome movie. And like, I'm not a huge fan of the whole vampire genre, but he's really, really good. And it also has the kid who's like the kid in, um, uh, oh darn, what's it called? River's Edge. Right, right. And he's so badass, and I love him. He's yeah. just, uh, it's really good. Well, it's, it's a, a neat mashing together of yeah. two things that hadn't been done, uh, like vampire movies at the time were kind of sunk down, as well as westerns. Yeah. So it was sort of fusing the vampire genre with the western genre and creating this kind of new thing in the late 80s. Well, and also, they're not cool. Like, they're not cool vampires no. where they're all, like, Lestat or whatever. Yeah. They're, like, traveling around in a crappy van and trying to stay out of the sun. Yeah, exactly. So that one's great. Definitely yeah. worth checking out. Uh, 1994's True Lies. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Tom Arnold, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. But, of course, this is where, you, again, you start to see, you think of Bill Paxton as this guy that just plays the dad, basically. Maybe he's chasing a, a twister around or something. Yeah. But, you know, we've seen him as Chet. We've seen him as Hudson. And now he's this sleazy car salesman. And he's got all these great colloquialisms. Uh, again, we can't really mention yeah. them on TV, but they're, they're really <laughs> funny. And I guess he, like, got a lot of those from his dad, who used to speak in these funny uh, colloquialisms all the time. So, uh, so he just got all these really hilarious lines, and he just plays this total sleazy bag that uh, Schwarzenegger and Tom Arnold end up kind of manipulating and he, he's really funny in it. He is good and it's a ridiculous movie but he he shines. Yeah. So. Uh, and the last one is uh, maybe less nerdy but it does have a great nerd connection. It's a 1998's A Simple Plan. So and it's good. About, uh, Billy Bob Thornton and Bill Paxton play two brothers who come across this suitcase of money and it's kind of like uh, you know what they decide to do with the money and how that tears them apart and of course this was directed by Sam Raimi who we know from Evil Dead and Spider-Man and and this is a, again, it's a movie I haven't actually seen in a while. I need to rewatch it. But uh, again, another like, it's, it's a movie from a director that we normally see as this kind of crazy nerdy director, but making this more sort of straight ahead crime thriller drama. Right. And it's, uh, it's, re it's really good. And he's really good in it. So it, it is uh, excellent. I would say uh, it is very sad that we've lost Bill Paxton. And rest in peace, good sir. That's right. Well, thank you for bringing to our attention these awesome movies. And yeah, Godspeed. Well, thank you for joining us for another episode of Punch. So much, so many great things happening this month, as we said. I want to thank Richard Carnegie for coming on and talking about the Star Wars extravaganza that's coming up with the symphony. Also want to thank Kathleen Poole for bringing in her beautiful eggs. I really am coveting those a lot. And of course, thank you to Craig and to Tony and to Hank for the tweet beat. And a couple more things I want to put on your radar. It is, of course, as I said, Tabletop month, and at the end of the month is Tabletop Day. There's going to be some really cool things happening in the city, so you want to check out all the events that are going on. And also, um, Elaine Will has a Dust Ship Glory reading at McNally, so you want to go check that out. She did the uh, Button of the Month Club for Punch for the uh, latest button, so beautiful. And there are still memberships available if you want to be part of that exclusive club that gets a new artist creation every single month. So you can check out that on our Facebook Facebook page and uh, learn a little bit more about that. So have an awesome nerdy month and keep your dukes up.
recording? Yep. Welcome to the collector. Bop! <laughs> <laughs> Ready to go?